All right, well, are we ready to kick things off? My name is Shannon Martin Roebuck. I am the Executive Director of Bridging Impact, and my co-host today is Allison Cardona, and she is the California State Director at UC Davis Courette Shelter Medicine Program. We're so happy to have you here today to talk about partnerships, especially in the wake of spring being upon us and shelters being even more full than, than normal, unfortunately. And so my question of the day today is, how are you dealing with the prospect of the beauty and busyness of spring around the corner? What do you do to prepare? I am one who stress cleans. So I guess that notion of spring cleaning would be me. Um, I will go around with a toothbrush doing detailed cleanings and that helps relieve my stress and I start to organize if I know I have stressful times ahead. So how are you dealing with spring around the corner? You know, not everyone has the same kind of highs and lows with kitten season, but how are you preparing knowing many shelters are already full? Going through closets, getting rid of things I haven't used for the last year. That's really hard for me. I think sometimes I have a little bit of a hoarder inside where I can't let things go. <laughs> Does anyone else do a lot of organizing or trying to write things out and plan ahead as the spring is upon you? Let's see, we've got some things popping in. Thinking ahead to daffodils, not being in the snow, yes. Breath work and exercises, therapy sessions, yes. Playing a loud piano. Getting foster lists updated, that's very important. Sorting towels, blankets, treats, renewing protocols, yes. Doing inventory, what supplies will you need? <laughs> and doing channeling spring cleaning. <laughs> yes, that is my, my big thing for the spring. Renovating shelter for the first time in 40 years. That's a huge cleanup. Congratulations to being able to do that. Accepting a new position, learning everything about the rescue, staff training, foster check ins. Awesome. Well, I hope that here we're having, I think, what's called a false spring where we're having 54 degrees when it shouldn't normally be that cold. So I hope all of you are getting some better weather as well. Getting rid of emails, updating files. That is one thing I need to do as well. For today's national announcements, we are going to kick off with an announcement from Cindy Delaney from UC Davis LearnVerse. Good morning. I think it's morning for most of us. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody had heard about a new event that we are having. It's the Spring 2023 Shelter Summit, and it is a half-day online event. I am going to share a little video, and then I'll tell you a teeny bit more about it. Let's see if this all works. Fingers crossed. It's super rainy here, and so my internet is like, I <laughs> can't do it. Got a long way to go. Can you guys hear the video? I know you got a long road home. <laughs> yes. Wait, and then we don't. I can't hear the video anymore. I, I did in the beginning. <laughs> Cindy, can you restart? Yeah, you want to try and share again? Because this is so worse waiting before. Go ahead and restart it. Yeah, let me see if Zoom will put, let me um, share the sound a different way if it's being silly. Here we go, guys, try again. I love technology. We've got a long way to go. I know we've got a long road home. I know we've got a long way to go. Let's do this. Oh, 
Falling on survivors uh, Are you up all night? Uh, we can take it higher Let's do this Let's do this All right, so it is, like I said, it's a half day online event on March 14th, so coming right up. And what we're trying is a little bit of a new hybrid type of learning where you can attend this thing live or on demand because we'll record it. And then after the event, what we're doing during the event is we're introducing five really critical concepts to get population under control and improve outcomes. So we've got five different topics that we'll introduce at the summit really quickly, like half hour each. Then after the summit, we're given the opportunity to enjoy these fast tracks so people can join a fast track and learn more about one of the programs and get personalized coaching from the coach who's also a speaker. So we're gonna have these little series of meetings over an eight week period after the summit where you can attend a live meeting every other week with office hours options in between. And so if you want to learn more and start implementing, this is going to be a great way to do it. And as Allison's saying, there's CE offered for this, Kawa, Naka, and um, Race. And then the other option we have is if you're really like, I really want more accountability, you can actually apply to be one of the special shelters and what we're calling a track pack, where you get even more options for coaching. And we're going to kind of use those shelters as like case studies in the whole uh, fast track. So over the eight weeks, we'll be like, oh, here's a challenge someone's facing in our track pack. Here's how they're dealing with it, or let's get your ideas. So we're trying to make it really interactive and implementation focused. Like we want you to come out of this thing with something that you feel good about that actually implements that program. So we would love to see you there. If you wanna um, join us, we've got a website link for this page. And you can come and just register for it and we'll see you there. And it will also be available on demand. So take a look. And this is for everybody. It's not just for leaders or management. It's actually for all your frontline staff too. Because we want them to get excited about these changes and help kind of drive change in their own roles. So everybody is welcome. And we would love to see people show up and partake in this and give us feedback on if it was helpful for you. So. It is mostly focused for shelters, Maris, um, but there's plenty of other information that anybody who supports a shelter or is a stakeholder would benefit from knowing. All right, that's it, thank you. Any questions? All right, I'm muting and unsharing. Thank you so much for that. Does anyone else have any items they'd like to share, any updates? Hi, yeah, I can go next. I'm Sheila, the Director of Community Solutions from Maddie's Funds Fund, and I just wanted to announce that on March 9th, Thursday, we're going to be offering our next Maddie's Insights webcast, and I'm really excited that Dr. Nick Dodman, one of the most well-known veterinary behaviorists in the world probably, will be joining us alongside Ian Dunwoody to share some of the research they've done at the Center for Canine Behavior Studies. And they're gonna specifically be talking about treatment options for canine fears and anxiety. So it'll be at noon Pacific, Thursday, March 9th. Hope you can join us. Hello, this is Vincent with the Human Animal Support Services Project. And I wanted to make sure that in case you didn't get the email that we do have a, a webinar tomorrow that looks at some of the human animal support services, um, some of the highlights uh, in terms of st stats and um, our proof of uh, concept that we, um, that's part of our program. Um, as many of you, some of you may not know, we do have a data team, a research and development team that works with our pilot shelters to uh, look at what they are uh, doing well and maximize that. And then also we implement programs that are uh, to help them get to those um, live outcome goals and human animal bond goals that they are um, seeking. So uh, please register. If not, um, we're, we're, we can, we'll put a link in the chat for you to be able to register for that. Uh, so you have an idea of what's, what we're doing, but uh, please feel free to, to join. I have 
have one, Shannon, on behalf of My Dog is My Home. There's an incredible virtual conference coming up March 21st through 23rd. Registration is open. There's, it's incredible if you work animal welfare, but also in the human housing or homeless services. And it's really about co-sheltering. There's gonna be storytelling, listening circles, folks with lived experience, as well as short talks and workshops. And it's gonna be really good. So I hi highly recommend it. Hi everyone, I'm Irene from Maddie's Fun, and I just wanna make the last call announcement that this is the last community conversation for February. So be sure to watch any February community conversation recordings you may have missed and we'll be announcing the winners next week and I'll drop the link again in the chat. Thank you. Does anyone else have any updates they'd like to share? Right, then I will go into introducing our speaker today, Claire Callison, who is Director of National Operation at Austin Pets Alive, is here to talk with us about Next Level Partnership. So Claire, I will let you get started. Thanks, Shannon, and thanks, Allison, for co-hosting. Um, I'm part of the steering committee, and it's been a wonderful experience working with all of you and hearing from amazing speakers. So um, this is, it's a little different than I'm speaking today, but such an honor. So thanks for having me. I'm going to start the slideshow. All righty. Um, so I wanted to preface this that um, Next Level Partnerships, although you might hear me speaking about um, transfer and relocation programs nationally. Um, this, I'm hoping that this is really relevant, whether you're a municipal shelter um, or a foster-based rescue, and you, you might not be transporting out of state. Um, this is hopefully relevant for just in your backyard, our local partnerships that we have between each other. Um, and yes, as Shannon said, I'm a director of national operations here in Austin with Austin Pets Alive. And um, my small but mighty team and I, we work with shelters primarily in Texas, but we work um, all across the country and internationally and providing shelter support. So that is that looks like remote support. It's also in person. We look at operations from uh, start to finish, intake to, to outcome. And we work through um, all sorts of things, medical uh, support that's needed, um, space uh, crisis. And we also work with um, all, all levels of operation. We provide staff training. So if that's of help to anyone, uh, I'll make sure that you have our contact information. And then I also oversee our um, Texas transport hub that we've built here in Austin. We're really um, prioritizing helping shelters that have historically been left behind because they don't have the resources to transport on their own. Um, and that could look like providing health certificate support, rabies vaccinations, all the way to doing all the logistical coordination on their behalf, because many of the shelters we work with are just sort of one ACO operations and um, highly under-resourced with struggling live outcome rates. So we're we're hoping to be the connection between these shelters and life-saving outcomes and the national pipeline of support, which is all of you. So, all right. So um, I wanted to start off a little bit with just sort of my personal story. Um, I won't go on too long about it, but I think, you know, when I think about shelters and rescues and that dynamic, um, when I was reflecting on it, it really goes back to when I first started in the animal sheltering world. And I was very, admittedly, very naive coming into the sheltering world. I, um, my first job was an adoption counselor at what I didn't know at the time, but one of the largest municipal shelters in Texas. Um, the in intake was over 30,000. And sadly, when I started in 2009, um, about 20,000 animals were losing their lives and not, not having a live outcome. So that, as you could imagine, was a huge shock to me thinking I was going in and just gonna do adoptions all day. Um, the, the shelter has improved over the years, but, you know, many of those dogs and cats coming in were perfectly healthy and it was just a, a different time and we didn't have a lot of the live outcome options. So, um, when I was also working on trying to uh, build a foster program from nothing and also try to get as many local adopters as I could find, I was just marketing the individual dog in front of me and trying to recruit adopters, very grassroots. 
Um, I realized that uh, I, I did get a connection to a group randomly um, out of out of state that said they could help with 10 dogs. And that's how I stumbled in quite, quite honestly, stumbled into this transport world. It seemed like, you know, on in addition to the local work that I was doing, that transfer and, and working with a rescue partner that could save more than one dog at a time seemed like a really great experience. Um, and it was, uh, but it was, we were incredibly under-resourced, as you can imagine, in a, working in a shelter with that high of volume coming in. But this partner was asking me to take three different videos from three different angles, kennel approach, ask, see the dog, walking by a different dog, uh, meeting a man, meeting a woman, um, all these different strange scenarios. And we just didn't have the resources. But I was so scared that if I didn't provide that level of sort of customer service and that um, uh, that that service that they would just drop us and work with another shelter. So we bent over backwards. Um, I was paying out of my own pocket to provide transportation. I was we were sending incredible dogs there that were you know awesome with other dogs and cats. I would routinely get calls though of complaints if they weren't perfect, and I was just like living in fear and anxiety about. Um, you know, this partnership, it felt very one-sided. I was, you know, constantly worried they were going to drop us as a partner um, from the shelter perspective. Um, <laughs> fast forward a few years later, I went to my first American Pets Alive conference in Austin, and I, I will credit this. I look back, I'm like, I think this was my first thanks to Maddie moment because I'll never forget it. Mary Smith stood up in a room and said, tr the transport world is broken. It's innately broken. It's one-sided. You know, partners are taking advantage of desperate source and sending shelters. And I, I felt it was like a slap in the face. I, I truly felt hurt in that moment. I was like, that's me. You know, I don't, it's not normal to be living in anxiety, working with a partner um, and bending over backwards and getting nothing in return. We were paying for transport, transport. We weren't getting an adoption fee. Um, we were spending our own money with our resources when it could have been probably spent um, more efficiently locally. So I'll always credit Mary to kind of changing that path in my way of thinking and realizing that it was important for me to advocate not only for my time, but also my staff's time, the animals in our care and our resources, they were, they were precious. So thank you, Mary. I'm always, always grateful of that um, bird's eye view perspective I have. Um, and I was looking at these old photos of me and <laughs> I'm sparing everyone intentionally not to put a, a baby photo of me in animal welfare <laughs> for the first time. But I did stumble on my adorable dog that I um, adopted when uh, 14 years ago as a puppy. And I just, that was our last Thanksgiving together. Um, she's still alive. I shouldn't say last, um, more, more recent Thanksgiving. But I, I look back also as that was an adoption win for me because I lied on my adoption application of didn't have landlord approval, certainly didn't have enough money to pay for vet bills. So I'm so thankful that I got to adopt her and she's still with me 14 days later. I would have failed many adoption applications though, I will say that. So how do we solve this? You know, when Mary stood up in that room and said it's broken, how do we start solving for the problems that historically have plagued this shelter to rescue um, partnerships? And again, I'm not talking about just transferring. This doesn't just um, relate to groups that are transferring out of state for this to relate to you. Um, it can be local relationships as well between municipal and nonprofit organizations. But I, I really believe it starts with how we talk about one another and how we view the partnership. Um, it's not uncommon to look on social media or just hear it in the hallways. When, and I'm, I'm partly guilty of this too in the past of thinking that, you know, we're moving animals from one desirable community to another desirable community. So that inherently is pretty discriminatory, um, you know, saying things like save them from X shelter, you know, save them from um, South Texas or save them from Louisiana, right? That's like a big, um, that's a, it's a big stereotype of an entire state or an entire region. And it's, it's alluding to the fact that these, the people in these communities are not Good enough to have pets, and so that that can we can we can solve that today by just getting that language out of our social media, out of our marketing, and how we talk about our partners. Um, and this is on the on the rescue partner side. I would say you know making sure that a good rule of thumb I always say is if we're in a room and if, if our partner or shelter partner was also in the room, would we be saying those same things? So making sure we're always leading with respect. 
And one of the things that um, I didn't have a good roadmap for this, but I was trying to figure out, you know, as we're bringing in staff and volunteers and working in our Texas transport work and helping some of the shelters that we do that don't have as much as many resources as we do in Austin, how was I going to convey that and, and make sure that we we created this culture when bringing in staff and volunteers and working in these environments? And um, usually it's a board of directors and a director that creates an organizational mission, but it's okay, I felt, to have a program mission too or a statement. And this is a, just a little clip on the right of it. I, I won't read it out, but essentially it's, it's saying that, you know, our resources, our location um, does not determine our worth or value. So even if I'm a shelter that can't afford vaccines or can't afford food, it doesn't mean that I deserve less um, and that I'm not I'm not worth uh, worth helping or that I'm not intelligent or I don't know as much or that I can't bring something to the table and have an opinion. Um, and making sure that you know um, local first is important. So I think that's very helpful when I was onboarding staff and volunteers, there, there are people that I work with and that are out there that believe that transferring animals is the only reason for it is really to get them out of a, a hellhole, um, you know, or a shithole, <laughs> um, part of my part of my language, but I've heard that sort of verbiage used to describe different cities and different communities and uh, you know, by having a, a mission statement or a values program statement, that will allow you to be able to bring in people that are like-minded. So if someone is coming in and wants to be part of a transport program because they believe they're moving animals from um, sort of a less deserving place to a more desirable place, like Texas to New England, say, that's not what we do, and they're not going to be a good fit into our into our team. So that was helpful to have some way of, of creating some um, culture statement. And again, social media messaging couldn't be more important. Um, just the way we're portraying these partnerships is, is a huge first step. And again, this could be done tomorrow. And, and these are changes that I feel can be put in place immediately. Um, so this, this picture shows, um, you might have seen it before. I showed it at the Best Friends Conference, but it's incredibly moving. And um, it, it shows a, um, an area of the state that I think truly changed my perspective on the work we do and really shaped my the way I look at partnerships. But um, my colleague, uh, Jordana, who is also on this call, her and I went out to West Texas for a week and spent time with some of the shelters. If you're familiar with the state, it's out by um, the Big Bend area and right near the um, Texas and Mexico border. Um, we, we met the people that work at, at some of these shelters. And, and again, these are the shelters that do not have a budget for food. Um, you know, they don't have vaccines. And so they're really starting, starting from scratch. And, you know, this shelter in particular, it's so rural, it's hard to wrap my, my mind around it. But I remember these facts that it's um, the, the county that it's in is over the size, it's bigger than the size of Connecticut, but only has the population of about 9,000 people. So it's, it's giant. It's absolutely giant. There's not that many human <laughs> humans that live out in this area. So, but they do have a pretty high intake rate of pets, um, mostly because of their location on the border there. So incredibly challenged. They're over 90 miles to the nearest vet. So the work that they do in terms of, you know, getting, um, getting vaccinations, like the simple act of getting a rabies vaccination so a dog can go out of state in a health certificate, thinking that one woman wakes up, you know, at four in the morning and transports them to the nearest vet over 90 miles away, you know, secures a foster, um, drives sometimes 12, 13 hours to get them to the airport. I mean, it is, it's mind blowing. And she changed the way I look at things. Um, this one woman named Heather, who's out there bringing this coalition of West Texas shelters together, because she said to me once that after she puts them on a plane and does all this work um, and they get adopted and she doesn't hear anything back, she says it can be absolutely demoralizing. And I'm making it my mission anytime working with her and other partners to give updates. I get so busy, it's hard to remember. And I think we're all guilty of that. But sending that little text of a photo of the adoption or, hey, we got here safely and they're absolutely amazing. Thank you for sending me this dog. Um, that can make all the difference in the world. And it was just a little moment like that that I realized she was missing. She didn't get to celebrate the adoption moment, but yet she was doing all the work. Um, it also reminds me too of, the fact she she did tell me that the and it's changed the way I talk about things, but she said um, re the rescue didn't happen when the dog arrived, you know, in the in the other state um, with the adopter with that rescue partner. The rescue happened with all the people on the ground 
um, everyone who cared for those dogs and cats, um, taking them to the vet, getting them the medical care they needed, sending the records, doing all the logistics, like that is all rescue. It's not only one-sided. So I thought that was incredibly powerful and something that I bring with me and I, I'm not perfect. I will I'll admit all these are lessons that I've learned, but it's something that I, I think of when we're, when we're building our partnerships and, and working with shelters. So all, all of these um, things that we're talking about, like, okay, we know that some shelters have more, more resources than others. Um, you know, we started looking at, at Austin Pets Alive at the, and, and on our national team of what support we're providing. And in my mind, it was, it was very much like, here is um, a list of all the services we can provide you. And it was sort of this blanket idea of like, this is what we can provide. But getting into this more, it makes more sense to provide a more customized support or resource-based support, um, depending on who you work with, because it's not a one-size-fits-all. And I realized that historically, I was trying to kind of put this one-size-fits-all solution or, or support base. Um, so this is a real simple kind of um, little uh, infograph, a way of describing it, but say Group C is, a, is an organization or a shelter that has very few resources. Um, you can think about a few things to think about is, is definitely budget because that, that, you know, money, what can they afford? What do they have access to? And then other, and this isn't perfect, this is just one sort of version of it, and you can definitely um, think about it in different ways. But also access to vet care. You know, I think about that group that has to drive 90 miles to the nearest vet. I mean, not very accessible or spay neuter. Um, and then, you know, what are their live outcome rates? What are their intake rates? Looking at those things, and then the fundamental programs that are in place, because that really gives an indication of sustainability. If a group or shelter doesn't have a foster program or doesn't have the resources to do their um, own adoptions or have a volunteer program, these are all things that are good to look at. Um, and then you might have an organization that's getting there, right? Like has some of the fundamental programs in place. Is it okay budget, um, decent, maybe not adequate, but it's it's okay. They have access to maybe basic vet care, but they can't cover big high medical needs um, or anything like parvovirus or a broken leg, you know, could be really, really difficult. Um, and then you might have shelters and rescues that are uh, more highly resourced. So they have, you know, pretty robust programming in place, pretty adequate budget. They can do, they might even have an in-house veterinarian. So thinking about how we're all a little bit different and on this spectrum and the support that you're giving a group C is going to look a little bit different than group A. Um, and I will give an example. This is again of the two dogs on the, on the left in this photo here. They were when you're working with a shelter that's so small, like the one in that photo, you know, with only 12 kennels. If if twelve if two dogs are leaving, that's a that's a huge win. That's a huge um it's a huge win for that shelter. So it was not reasonable being seven hours from Austin one way to say, okay, just bring them to us, right? I mean that that requires probably some, a driver to have a hotel. Um, it's a you know 13 hour road uh, round trip. Uh, the the gas, the mileage, all of that, all the costs, the wear and tear on a car. So a way of providing support is before we never offered transport. We were always like, get them here and we'll help you. But I said, you know, I, I feel like this is not attainable for them to, to ask them to jump in a car and do this. Um, and so Pilots and Paws, I put the website here if anyone, uh, you, many of you probably use them, but we use them all the time. It's a great free resource and forum. We, on their behalf, um, pled for a transport ride from far west Texas to Austin, and within minutes got a volunteer pilot to go pick these two incredible dogs up, brought them to us in a fraction of the time, and the amount of resources that that saved the on the other side was huge, but it wasn't that much work on our end. So um, that's, a rel that's a pretty standard practice now if a group can't meet us halfway or it's transport is the biggest um, barrier for them. Sometimes it's just you know, we have more resources. Let's see if we can send a van or secure a volunteer pilot. Um, things, things to really think about. And these dogs are super cute, by the way. They were like flying in this really nice jet and just hopped right out like nothing ever happened. <laughs> Um, and then one last thing I'll say about this infograph that I don't, um, I want to emphasize that groups, it's important to note that groups can, they don't need to stay stagnant and they won't stay stagnant. Um, COVID has taught us and post-pandemic times have taught us that 
uh, resources and conditions and the environment can change quickly. So it's it's common for our like shelters that might be a group A drop to a group B or a group C or vice versa. There can be pretty drastic improvements in a short amount of time. So just making sure that you know this infograph doesn't mean that we're putting organizations or shelters into sort of stagnant buckets, but there's movement in between the levels. All right, so other ways to really think about that I've been playing around with and things that I'm honestly, quite honestly learning from other organizations and just taking inspiration from is how we break the old cycle. And, and I truly believe it's about strengthening the partnerships. Like, okay, how, you know, we know what's wrong in the past, but how do we get to the next level? And it's moving away from just a transactional partnership, which is historically what a lot of the rescue shelter has looked like. So one of the most, um, important things that I've seen. And if you're local, this should hopefully be easy. But even if you're 20, 30 minutes away as a rescue partner, but visiting each other, going and, and walking through kennels and seeing what a day in the life of somebody else looks like or your, your partner looks like, because our realities are so, it's just night and day. They're, it's so drastically different. And so I think you know, that that being in person and being present is just so incredibly powerful. And I, I really do feel that helps bridge that connection. And it's not just another email request for help, but there's a person on the other end of that. There's hardworking staff um, and animals that, that need our help. So if you can't, sometimes we're thinking about partnerships as you know, thousands of miles away or, you know, in a, in a different state, but there's also Zoom. Um, Zoom is great, you know, virtual walkthroughs. Um, having, inviting your, if you have a staff-wide um, organizational meeting, if you're a nonprofit partner, maybe invite one of your staff members or I'm sorry, shelter partners um, to that meeting would be really powerful. Introduce them, have them talk about their organization um, and bridge that again, getting, getting behind, uh, getting away from just email transaction. And it's more of a, a personal connection. Although I will say this picture is from a group in Maine, um, Animal Refuge League of Greater Portland that came down to Texas. They flew down. It was so powerful for them to come work a day, work a couple days, actually take photos, help with marketing. Um, and then they did uh, a plane ride or they did a transport at the end of it. They did all the kennels and all the prep and brought animals home with them. So having them, their presence, even though coming all the way from New England, it meant a ton. Um, Resources are a big reason why that couldn't happen. So this other photo here, even if you're like, well, I can't afford to like just send my staff away on a on a, a plane trip a, across the country, totally understandable. Um, there is another organization that even though um, they cannot they cannot take a ton of animals, they did they did have access to funding, so they were able. This here this photo is in um, Laredo Animal Care Services, which is on the border um, of another border of Texas and Mexico. And there, they were having a huge backlog of adoptions and to in, uh, incentivize rescues to pull. This group in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, Animal Adoption Center, every month funds a spay neuter clinic to enable animals to move through the shelter faster. So even though they might not be able to take that many animals, they're helping another partner be able to move uh, animals faster out to a live outcome. So I love thinking about creative partnerships like that. I think one of the things even that costs no money that we can do is when entering into a partnership or a new partnership, one of the sort of my pet peeves and, and biggest things that happen, and I have to check myself, honestly, when I'm on the other end of this, is um, making sure we're not entering with a laundry list of requirements first, saying, okay, well, working with us, you're going to need to, you know, I, there's all the housekeeping things, right? Like do the December parvo vaccines, two boosters, we can't take puppies under six months, right? They, there might be all this criteria, and that's important to go over. But I think the first thing for a partnership is to just listen, listen first, ask questions, get to know each other versus being so transactional. And again, not even hearing what the partner might need help with. Um, giving back, I've been seeing some really incredible uh, ways this has been happening. If you, if you are part of any transport programs, vans often leave empty when they're coming back to, um, coming back to the origin shelter. And so filling that van with food and supplies and making use of an empty vehicle coming back is something that is just genius. And I absolutely love, you know, sharing supplies. 
Um, Pasco County, I just heard last week, I was like, I want to steal this. Locally, we'll do, as a shelter, we'll invite rescue groups in. And I apologize if Pasco's on here and I'm butchering this. But um, what I understand of it is they have these supply district distribution days where they bring in, um, they share supplies with rescues. It's a good way to see each other in person. And they've also gotten some larger um, pet companies, pet pet supply companies in bringing in donations. So just sharing donations and supplies that way. I thought that was, that was huge. Other things we can do is giving wins. Um, I learned this from Acana, Acadiana Animal Aid, um, Janine Fouché in Louisiana. She um, always talks about giving your partner wins. And this might, um, you might not be able to take all dogs with sort of behavior quirks, but can you take one of the, you know, every shelter has a dog or cat that's been overlooked for no good reason, right? Can you take one of their long stays can you take one or two medical cases, hopefully more, or maybe a couple dogs that are just shy, shut down, maybe have some behavior quirks, right? Giving that shelter a win is just huge. Um, and for those that are doing this, absolutely love it. Um, I, think, I think it goes a long way and don't feel bad because even if it's just one cat or one dog, that, that makes a difference and it's a move in the right direction. Um, and then also giving regular feedback and check-ins. I reflect on some of my rough uh, first um, rescue partnerships of, it, again, being one-sided, me just apologizing the entire time, like, oh, I'm so sorry. But just, you know, like asking the question, what can we do differently? What could we help you with? You know, so it's not just feedback if you're a receiving organization or the rescue to giving the shelter a laundry list of things of complaints. So making sure you're asking question, like, is there anything we can do? I love when groups do that. And again, this is a reminder for myself <laughs> to, to keep doing these things. And then, um, you know, I'd like to think, you know, when we are talking about this, you know, I, I, right now it's not lost on me that I feel like, you know, I'm asking groups probably to do more. I'm trying to motivate us to do more and do more. And a lot of um, partners, nonprofits that have been taking animals, um, you know, they're having to make hard decisions of decreasing their numbers. And I hear that now. Um, and it might feel overwhelming. And I know it is overwhelming to have more requests for help that you can't fulfill. Um, it helps me personally to see it as a way to drive innovation. It is overwhelming and it can be a little bit depressing to be like, I can't help everybody who's asking for it or every shelter, but try to use it the way I try to um, turn it in my head is using it as an opportunity and to initiate action. Um, I think about any program I've ever initiated, any sort of pilot program I've, I've ever led, and it's all come out of necessity. It's all been driven, not because I'm bored, but because there is a shelter that needs me and I have to be very creative quickly to be able to help them. So hopefully seeing it as a way to innovate and, and um, think about things in a different way could be a way to see this and it's not so depressing. Um, Things that, you know, for the nonprofits out there or, or the rescue partners that, again, I'm, I'm on that side of it more often than not now, but some of the things to look at would be scrutinizing barriers to entry. So that is, you know, the example, um, this is a flyer that we just put out, um, a, a group um, in Texas was there's parts of regions of, of Texas that are hard to find volunteers to help transport. So can we do some of the marketing for them? Um, providing vaccines. A lot, of, a lot of organizations can't get help because their animals aren't vaccinated. So as a more resourced um, organization, we were like, how can we help get you vaccines, right? Can we apply for a joint grant to be able to get you these things? And for those of you that are doing this already, I think, thank you, <laughs> that's, that's such, such a huge help. So instead of saying, no, we can't help you, it's like, how can we help you get, this, get the support? Um, Looking at you know your lengthy process to get help, it has to be easy and fast. Um, you know, a lot of organizations. I just talked to an animal control officer, animal field officer, and he does not have a computer. He only has his phone. So if I if he had to send lengthy emails or fill out forms or you know go through a long process to get help, that's a barrier. So really looking at that. Um, you know, I think it's it's a balance between, and I, I have trouble with this sometimes, but streamlining our my operations as a, as a rescue organization rescue organization can't come at the cost of someone else doing more work. Um, I think about that, like I, you know, I was talking to a partner, we were working together, and I I realized I was filling out like their intake 
like they're doing their data entry. And I'm like, I, I just don't have time for this. So the solution was like, they, they found a volunteer to be able to do that. So um, that also comes, I see uh, commonly with videos, right? Give me all this marketing material so I can get a foster. That can be pretty hard when you're, it helps the, the nonprofit partner, but it's very hard on a shelter sometimes to provide all that content. Um, things like flexible arrival times, flexible pickup times, um, all of that, like as, as convenient as it can make it for you, it, if it comes at the cost of another, it's not really worth it and it's worth looking into and see if there's some flexibility. Um, as an organization builds resources, if you're um, one that helps another, it's important to look at taking risks, like just because you've always, you, you've done something always one way, right? Like we, we cannot take dogs um, that are not uh, uh, great with other dogs, right? So if you are building your organizational um, resources and now you have a robust behavior team and you've got some support, you know, can you start looking at that policy and making sure that, well, maybe we could consider some dogs, even if they're not perfect with another dog, can we start considering them? So as you build resources, thinking about the risks that you can take, um, and there is this trend that as you get more organized and you get more efficient, sometimes that can come with rig um, some rigidness and there you have to balance that with the ability to act fast and be able to say yes, because some of these deadlines, most of them are very real, real um, and the resources are lacking. So the ability to move fast and um, to be flexible is super important. And then one thing I would say last to this would be to really play to your strengths. Um, even if you're like, ah, oh, gosh, you know, we, we just don't have very many, many um, behavior resources. We don't have a behavior team, and but we have a pretty robust medical team um, and we don't have any breed restrictions, right? That, or we can take heartworm positive dogs. Those things are really important too and are needed. So play to your strengths on that. Um, you know, while you're working on maybe ramping up your behavior capabilities as a, as a rescue organization, you could look at your medical capabilities and you can look at the things that you can do um, and what you can give back because those things are super important as well. And then I think for um, both shelters and nonprofits, um, scrutinizing all bottlenecks to placement is the biggest one. I think like, you know, when, when we're talking about um, how do we get more help, um, the power of yes, I am going to plug Allison Cardona's webinar. It's, it's truly incredible, the resources in there. And um, even though you're like, no, 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 we got rid of <laughs> barriers, we don't have any, I, I promise you we all do, every organization. So it's important to just look in and see um, what you can do to, to make it easy for people to help. Um, if you hear things like we tried it before, it didn't work, or we don't have fosters, we don't have adopters, to me, that's an opportunity for a pilot program. Um, that's an opportunity to try something new. Um, Short-term short -term fosters, trial adoptions for certain dogs, and the, in the, literally the, the theme of it all is just making it easy for people to help. I know that seems super simple, um, but it's true. Just making that barrier to entry just gone and people can just walk in your door and help today. Um, thinking about joint marketing campaigns as well. So highlighting your partner shelter and the impact they can have. Um, I will plug some really great um, marketing and press release if you're getting real full for space, which I know many of us are. There's some good toolkits on um, the Human Animal Support Services website and also HeartSpeak if you're not familiar with that website. Um, absolutely. And that organization, definitely, definitely visit. Um, and I know we're winding down here, so second to last slide, um, for shelters that are, are looking to build networks and bridge support, <clears throat> a lesson, again, that I've learned is um, don't have shame in where you're, you've, you do not have enough resources, you don't have a shiny shelter, your, your data is not what you like it to be, you wish you had more live outcomes, that's okay, share these things, be transparent, and ask for help. Um, talk about what you can offer, you know, like if you, if you can't offer spay neuter, that's okay, but all your animals are vaccinated on intake. That's huge, you know, say that, put it out there um, and ask for help. <clears throat> Networking is, is a really big part of this. Um, it's uncomfortable for me, so I feel you <laughs> putting yourself out there. Um, one of the things that's been helpful to bridge contacts, if I reach out to someone and ask if they can help, if they can take any dogs or cats from my shelter, and they say no, I ask them if they could connect me, help me, like who do you know? Um, could you make some connections? And that has been really helpful because you get brought into coalitions of support, even if the one group that you've reached out to um, can't help you at the time. 
I think it's important, especially when we're talking about transport, we're talking about rescue as a shelter to remember that a lot of these solutions are in your backyard. Um, we have to build a, a transparency and trust with our community. And some of the old things that we, we have worked for years still work, adoptions, um, less restrictive adoptions, bringing in events, um, embracing fosters, these are the things that help us get movement. And a lot of times it's a much um, more efficient, um, easier approach to ask for your community support. Um, and I know a lot of communities feel like, well, my, my shelter is different or my community is different, but um, people will, will want to help. And, I, and we've seen it in all regions of the state, no matter uh, in the country, no matter the challenges. Um, I think looking at your process and the experience when we're talking about local support, from the eyes of the, the customer or the eyes of the guest walking in, you know, how welcoming are you? Customer service is huge. Um, are they getting barked orders? Like don't put your fingers in the kennels at the first, at the first greeting, right? You know, making sure like there's pictures on the walls that are welcoming and happy and it's not just um, sort of doom and gloom and, and a bunch of rules. So I think that's important, uh, especially as we look at moving from the, the appointment-based COVID times to, just opening up the doors and allowing people to come in and help. Um, I think it's also the last couple of things I'll say is organization is absolutely huge. Um, as, a, as a shelter looking to get help, having just being positive and, and pretty fast at uh, communicating as my inbox is filling up and I probably owe a lot of people on this emails, I apologize, but um, trying to be as fast as you can with getting responses and celebrating wins together. Um, and just being really honest about what you can do, like going back to thinking about me doing those videos when I had you know, 30,000 annual intake shelter I was working at, you know, that was not a great use of my time. So don't being, not being afraid to advocate for efficiency and what's realistic and utilizing volunteers, because often we're short staff for the work that we need to do. Um, utilizing volunteers are absolutely huge. We recently have just built up a couple work from home volunteers that are doing our data entry and building our spreadsheets. And it's been such a huge help um, when gathering information on individual dogs. So last thing, I, I have a few, um, like the Power of Yes webinar, I have a few resources, resource links I wanted to include here. Um, I did wanna do a, a call to action for all of us in good spirit when I was showing you that shelter in West Texas. Um, they just, uh, I told her, Heather, that I would be sharing a, a picture of the shelter in the region. And she got together an Amazon wish list. I said, I'm going to be on a really big call with a lot of incredible people. So um, we'll we'll share that in the chat if it hasn't been shared already. But she put a wish list together of all the things that she would love. And it will absolutely make her day if we could send her a few things. There's treats and, and um, easy walks, harness, and all sorts of things, things that she needs to do her flights. Um, so that would be incredibly powerful if we could do that. Um, other links here, I know we're winding, uh, the Maddie's University, there is a self-paced course if you're interested um, that I worked with uh, the great team at Maddie's to put together. It's called Transport as a Tool for Transformation. If any staff or volunteers want to go through that, it's completely free and self-paced. Um, and then every third Tuesday of the month, um, Haas has a transport job alike that I would love to connect with all of you. It's a monthly call. It's pretty casual. And we have different guest speakers and we discuss um, shelter and rescue partner topics. And then if anyone is um, looking for some adorable dogs and cats, uh, I, I'm sharing a link to our uh, the Texas Transport Hub that um, the team that I lead and the work that we do so you can see some of the candidates for transport. Last but not least, my email. And then I hope it didn't cut off but our shelter support at AmericanPetsLive.org that reaches my um, incredible team, small, small and mighty team that will get right back to you and uh, being able to help you no matter what state or country you're in. If you need any support with operations, we can provide remote support and also even talk about in-person options if that is something you're interested in. So um, that is it. I went right to the end there, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions on, on the pet forum or um, I think I'm sure Allison uh, Gibson put my email in the chat. So <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much, Claire. I just, I appreciate so much your thoughtfulness and also how you brought in about language and how important that is. Um, I think folks need to remember that when they say things like something's a hellhole or something even worse, 
you're talking about people. You're talking about where people live, where people work, um, where people love. And yeah, it's really hurtful um, and discriminatory. So I love that you brought that in. Um, I know we have, we just have one minute, but there was one question from Emily Wood. If you're still on, if you want to unmute real quick and ask Claire. Sure, sure. I, I was asking about places, um, we're mostly a source shelter, but transferring animals to, and feeling that desperation to transfer animals to places that maybe have a really different philosophy, um, may speak about us like we're a hellhole or may have really pro prohibitive um, adoption applications or may um, behaviorally treat animals differently than we would? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I am a very wordy speaker, so I apologize we didn't have more time for questions. But um, I think definitely an onboarding call, that's one of the things that I think is so important. Um, I try to, now with Zoom, I try to see people face-to-face -face so I can really, um, as from the the source perspective, so they can see me and and see that I'm a person. Um, and I we speak about all those things. You know, I talk about sort of where their line in the sand is with different things, behavior, sort of adoptions, and make sure it's a good fit. And I think it's okay to say no. Um, I know that's it's hard to think about that when you're in a desperate um, desperate place, but it's it's okay to say no if a partner isn't a great fit. Um, having an agreement to also that MOU is also very helpful to um, make sure that it, it is a true partnership that's going to align. And I always try to invite people down. I need to do more of that. But maybe you could also, I know that it's not always, um, you know, able to be done uh, financially. But if someone could come visit and see the reality and sort of see uh, what you're up against, I, I think that is is really powerful and hopefully will help Um you know, help the groups look at their internal policies a little bit more. So yes, as you said, we're continue this on the Maddie's Pet Forum. Claire, thank you so much for being so intentional and your thought leadership and really modeling um, what that looks like. So thanks everyone, have a wonderful week and we'll see you in a week on Monday.